I say it humbly, but it's a very unusual book. And although it's my story, I sort of found it unusual when I read it. Who's it written for? You know, um, villains, addicts, um, broken people, you know, all ranges of people that are broken. People who are frightened to reveal their inner truths. There's so much else in there about crime, about relationships, uh, it's betrayal, dysfunction, poverty, wealth, um, prisons, uh, big crimes. There's enjoyment for a, a number of different people in there, I believe. And I just pray that we, that people have hope that they can change the future if there's been a number of sort of dysfunctional situations in their own uh, forefathers. I've got few in mind. Red moon on the rise, you say your last good night. Hi everyone, um, I'm Hattie Compton. I'm just going to pass over to Michael, he's going to introduce everyone. Hello, are we on live? We're on live, yeah. Everyone's listening, hi guys. Um, yeah, you know me, I'm Michael. I'm Michael Emmett. It's what this is about today, this book. I've invited two of my dad's friends, old friends. Um, Eddie Richardson, uh, who you might even know about. He, he's a notorious man, a lovely man. Um, but he was a, the, the high echelon to the criminal fraternity. Very well respected. A very kind man. Very trustworthy man. And then I've got Uncle Bob, my old mate Bobby McHugh, who I've known for many, many years. Incredible man, was a, lived both sides of the coin uh, with criminals. Billy Hill, a notorious criminal back in the day. Uh, and Bobby also had friends like, he was very good friends with Eddie and Charlie Richardson and everyone liked Bobby, very well respected man. And he also used to mix with the stars, uh, Ronnie Corbett, the famous Richard Harris, uh, all sorts of people. And he's been with me, been like an uncle to me, Bob. Um, very influential in my inter introduction into my criminal life. Very trustworthy man. I'm very honoured to have them both here today. So thanks very much. So I co-wrote Sins of Fathers with Michael. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, it's been the most incredible project over the past 18 months. Michael and I actually go right back to when I was a child. I used to hang out with his daughter Beth at our church summer holiday in Suffolk. Michael has also come across my dad through Christian prison work, albeit different sides of the law. My father is a retired judge. People often question how I wrote the book when there are clear differences between Michael and me. But actually, it really boils down to the fact that Michael and I just really get on and have great respect for each other. I'm sure slash hope Michael will agree with me. When we met through Michael's agent, Simon, 18 months ago, it was an instant click. I remember Michael calling me a wild card, as I wasn't perhaps the most obvious person to write his story. But it really worked and actually turned out we have many similarities. So to start us off, Eddie and Bobby, you both met Michael through his father, Brian. Eddie, do you remember the first time you met Michael? Uh, I, yes, I remember Michael was about 17, I think, because I knew his father very well. Brian, a good, solid family. That's all I can say, really. Can Bobby tell you where he met me? Or should I tell you? Well, I was at my dad's yard, Arthur Sutty's yard and Brian Emmett's yard. They knew ones of commercials. And, and you was, I hope you don't mind me saying it, you'd just been, finished a, a heavy prison sentence uh, and you was coming out for, for working. You was on, in a hostel and you walked into the yard in, in, and I don't mean to embarrass you here, but you walked into the yard in Battersea and I knew, I knew about the, your notoriety and all of a sudden I looked up and you were standing in front of me. And I thought, oh, my God, it's Eddie Richardson. Because <laughs> a mountain of a man, but always a very polite man. Always a, and then he used to go and take me over to Chelsea with Arthur and Brian. And, um, yeah, that was the first time I met. I was 17. Very impressionable, I was saying. And, and, Bobby, how about you? Do you remember when you first met Michael? I think I met him through Billy Hill. His father, <laughs> his father was a friend of Billy's. They were the same type, you know, old fashioned. And he was only a youngster at the time. And I met him three years afterwards. I got to be very friendly with him. Well, Billy Hill was a notorious, um, before the Richardsons and the Craze and all that, Billy Hill sort of run the West End. Um, he was into all sorts of things with illegal, yeah. illegal, illegal, I think Bobby's the best one to tell you that. But um, 
you know, he was into all sorts of things of illegal gambling and everything. And Bobby was his right hand man. Uh, he loved Bobby, but I think Bobby should tell you a bit about that. Actually, can't you tell him Bob about Bill? Well, Billy, um, was sort of, but to put it this way, the craze who allegedly be gangsters earned about uh, whatever they earned. They earned ten percent. <laughs> the riches that made made them look silly by maybe twenty or thirty percent. But Billy made them both look silly by the, he made 100% of where it's possible. He, he made more money than the two of them put together with due deference to Eddie. That's how he was. He ran everything from illegal gambling to bank robberies. Which, he ran London. He would get permission in those days for them to take the pictures of Trafalgar Square, get to get to through Billy or, or somebody that Billy knew. That's what Billy was. For the sake of those in our audience who aren't familiar with the crime scene in London in the 60s and 70s, can you tell us a bit about what life was like then? Well, I suppose I was a lot younger, but I mean, I don't want these guys to say anything they don't want to say, but it's documented the sort of crimes that they was involved with. Um, and I don't speak to this new technology. I don't think they, they're not used to all this new technology. And um, But, you know, from what I remember... Uh, and I don't want to glorify it all, but these guys, Eddie and Brian and, and Bobby, they, they were sort of like war children. And, you know, they, they we, we, on the way over in the car, he was talking about, you know, our, the poverty of, of, of his grandmother and how they used to buy jam uh, and all things like that. And I think what happened to a lot of these guys, you know, they came out of this sort of poverty situation and they wanted to earn money. They was all in the army. They all done right things in their lives. They wanted to look after their families. Uh, and, you know, they was from the flats and proud of it. And so am I, proud to be from the flats. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what we knew. And, and it's not to say to glorify that, but that's the life that we knew. But it was a, 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 these two guys, you know, a, the honour amongst these two guys was you keep your mouth shut. You know, if you're going to do the crime, you know, then you've got to do the time. Uh, and, you know, you can Google Eddie, you know, he's a lot of years behind the door, very respected man. Um, you know, he was part of the Frankie Fraser situation, all those situations. If you want to Google it, you find out, um, you know, that's just how they lived. And, and, and if they live like that, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, not everyone's cup of tea, that life. But, but they were proper that, you know, it, it, there was rules and regulations about being a criminal. And one, it was a war. You know, Eddie, Eddie had a name in the criminal fraternities that was second to none. You know, if you, if you wanted to be a criminal, and I'm not trying to beef him up here, but Eddie was the way you sort of, you would eliminate that. I'm not saying he's clever, but, you know, he's a tough man, very honourable, very kind to people, and, 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 took, and done his prison sentence many, many years. Never said a word, just got on with it, because he knew that that was the, that was the pay, that was the consequence of, of doing what he'd done. So I got a lot of respect for both of them. Mm, absolutely. Um, thanks, Michael. So now we'd love to show you a little clip of Michael telling us a bit more about the book. Here's a short video. One of the main interests for us in trying to create something is to try and understand what it is that people are trying to express in their own lives, what their relationships signify. I say it humbly, but it's a very unusual book. And although it's my story, I sort of found it unusual when I read it. Uh, it's a story about my life um, as a criminal to redemption. Is that enough? It talks about debt, it talks about uh, adultery, it talks about crime, it talks about drug addiction. Um, it talks about love as well. To get them to think about their own lot, their own time situation, just for a moment differently. That seems to me to be an important thing to be able to do. The structure of anything you do within the community should be carefully considered. When I got into my early teens, I, I really sensed that there was something wrong. Uh, and it wasn't wrong because it was a mental... I, was, I wasn't mentally ill, bless the mentally ill. Or I, I was something wrong with me. But it, it, it was something that was apparent inside of me. Um, and it used to sleep when I slept. 
but it used to wake up when I went and wake, woke up, and it, and it had a mood change. It, it had a, it had something to say. There's a saying in in recovery that one is too many and a thousand not enough. Uh, so the first one's the dangerous one. So the darkness, it became very apparent. I started thieving at a very young age. What was your question, John T? I bloody forgot it. I suppose the reason I wrote the book, uh, well, first of all, I found it quite exciting about writing my book, then got quite frightened about it. But I think I wrote this book um, because of the change in my life. Uh, and I just pray that we, that people, have hope that they can change the future if there's been a number of sort of dysfunctional situations in their own uh, forefathers. I've got few in mind. Um, who's it written for? You know, um, villains, addicts, um, broken people, you know, all ranges of people that are broken, people who are frightened to reveal their inner truths. I pray it's for everybody who's hiding their little secrets because they're frightened of what someone might say or, or, or they expect they've got to live with it. We never fall too far for us to come back. There's always love. There's, there's, always, there's always something to help us back on our feet. And I pray that we open up avenues for people to come in and not feel under pressure, threatened, or something's weird because we all need the light. Amen. Should we do that again? So there, there's some people here who haven't read the book, so we just love to give a flavour of Sins of Fathers. So here's Michael reading the prologue. Where's my glasses? Hold on, are my glasses there? Now, it's becoming, it's, it's, it's like the reality of this is war. Uh, diddly dee. Shall I rumble, sir? Prologue. A black gulf of police lights tears across Biddeford Bridge through the blistering rain towards us. We try to do a U-turn, but I can see men with guns. We're trapped on the quayside. Armed coppers jump out, then the megaphone. Michael Emmett, don't move. Get down on your knees. Drive, I say to Al Trotter. I get down in front of the vehicle out of arm's way. Peter Bracken looks like he's got measles from the red target docks of the police weapons. Drive, I say again. They're going to kill me. Al, drive, mate, drive. Al panics and drives off in second gear. It's, it's too late, it's over. Then Peter jumps out of the car and attempts to dive into the sea, nearly killing himself himself. Reinforcements come up from behind and start hitting him with the pistol when he resists. I get out of the car screaming and shouting, leave him alone. Put your hands on your head, one of the officers says, pointing his pistol at me. I can see one officer in front of me, two behind. One of the geezers has a massive handgun. They've bought in the big boys, I realise. No, I ain't doing anything, I tell them. It's midnight, it's cold, and there's so much noise. Everyone shut up, I shout. Everything stops. There's a silence, but the chaos comes back. But the chaos comes back quickly. The armed coppers come from behind me and smack me on the back. As I go over, one of them says, he's got a concealed weapon. He's put something in his mouth, another one says. I've got someone's number, but they're not getting it, and I swallowed a piece of paper. They knock me to my knees. The chief customs officer, who's been trying to get me for 18 months, says, a penny for your thoughts. Starting to weep, I say, my three children. You're what? My three children. Leave me alone. I feel like I've taken him down a peg or two. I've taken the shine off his arrest. He's already talking about his kids. Don't talk about my kids, mate, I bristle. But I can't win. Stand up, says the chief. We got you, Emmett. We got you. You at me now. He puts the handcuffs on me and pushes me right over. Now I'm his trophy. They think I'm a tough boy. They don't realise that behind the mask is a broken soul. He's good. So you've got some good memories, haven't you, of um, Michael, of the Great Train Robbers. Do you perhaps want to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... <laughs> You know, whatever people think about the Great Train Robbery, 
and whatever they think, you know, get excited oh, or they no, don't like I, it. I knew most of them and uh, I was in prison with most of them as well. So. Uh, that was all nice, you know, friendly, nice guys. Mm, Obviously, uh, they wanted to get a pound note, so they did. But apart <laughs> from that, mm. they didn't uh, do much damage and uh, got a lot of money. But uh, most of them lost it or squandered it or whatever. You know, it all seemed to go to nowhere, didn't it? Adventure. Yeah. yeah. How many years did you do in prison? Do you mind me asking, Eddie? What? How many years did you do in all behind the door in prisons? Uh, well, I survived uh, a lot. I lost a lot of remission and uh, I was in, you know, tying up, escape, tying up screws, trying to escape, uh, mutiny at Durham, smashing visiting rooms up. I mean, one thing after another, I lost 450 days remission. Oh, yes. And uh, so, uh, you know, it wasn't all uh, good, but I survived it all. And uh, there you are. How many years you do in prison? About 15 in all, wasn't it? Or more? No, no more it's, than <laughs> it's all to do with the culture around yeah. you, what you do. Yeah. So most of the things that have gone on in life are to do with the culture and what's going on at the time. Yeah. Yeah, well said, Eddie. So some of the uh, things, people look at it and they say, cool, he was a bit violent, but at the time it didn't seem violent. It just seemed part of living. Yeah. I understand that. Bless you, Eddie. Can I answer a question about the train robbers, if you don't mind? Yeah. Thank you, Eddie. So, I mean, my... I was going to tell you, Michael, about the train robbers. There was, with all the ones they got, they, one of them got away and it was never arrested and died about a year ago. One of them did get away. You know Absolutely, that? I know uh, that was Danny, Danny Pembroke. That was he's a good friend of mine. Yeah, Danny always wore gloves and things like that. Yeah. So that's why he never left anything at the palm. No, oh, absolutely. Do you know what? When you who's ever listening here, no one's trying to glorify anything. But if you if you talk about criminals, what they're talking about was 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 the elite. You know, it was the elite and. And, you know, war children, trying to get a few quid. But a lot of them was incredible guys. Really, I mean, really got really lovely guys. Plenty of plenty of sort of balls. Sorry for terminology. We use the Spanish word, cojones. It's not so offensive. Um, but you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was wartime for them. You know, it was to feed the families. It was to get money. And you know what? Back in the day when I remember it, there weren't a lot of ego about with these criminals then. It was their job. You know, some great friends of my dad's, old John Chandler, what he's done. But to me, the great train robbery was something that I thought was quite amazing. You know, very foolish how they got arrested. But my, my favourite one, and I got on with him really well, was Gordon Goody. Um, he, he, he turned me on to a bit of cannabis when I was a kid, Gordon. Um, much to my dad's dismay, although my dad was one of the biggest cannabis smugglers at the time, he didn't like his kids using it. So, you know, curiosity killed the cat. And I got used to get stoned with Gordon. God, he was a cracker. Right nice fella. You know, very talented. Um, he, he gave a guy a guitar that he, he had for 14 years in the nick. I wound up having a fight with this guy very foolishly. Um, and he came to my rescue down in a place called Mahaka. Not that I'm proud of all that stuff, but there was a different sort of, there were different people to me. I, 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 I know that we don't want to say about criminals, but for me, I loved them. And, and, I, and, and you know, all they were trying to do, unless they have it right, they all done their prison sentences well. And so I've got a lot of respect for all them sort of guys. But the train robbery to me was, wow, you know. Michael, uh, Michael a lot of them was also done for the excitement. 
when the excitement yes. they got out, it wasn't just because they wanted the money. The excitement was very important to them, a lot, especially the ones who'd been in the war. They wanted to carry on. People like Eddie Chapman. Eddie Chapman, yeah. Made a, a huge success. They all were looking for that little extra excitement out of life, not necessarily just money. So we're going to go to some questions from the audience now. We've got people sending in questions. And and the first one, um, which maybe Michael you want to start with, is it's um, how do you survive in prison mentally? Um, well, you, you know, I, I, I suppose, how do you survive in prison mentally? You know, it, it, I, when you go into prison, it's a very, look, when you go into prison, you know what to expect, you know? So you, you can't go in there and not expect to, 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 to survive. And we're, we're creatures of habit, yeah? So a lot of us take cannabis, get stoned, uh, and that's the antidote. But for me, for me, I, I was struggling, not with any criminals. I wasn't frightened of any of them. I wasn't frightened of any prison officers. I wasn't, I wasn't even frightened about being locked up. But, but I had a few mental health issues, especially after my brother died, and I weren't too happy. And, and I was in a cell with my father for two years. Trust me, that was difficult. Bless his heart. I love him dearly. But Bobby will tell you, and Eddie, living with Brian in a, in a six by eight is difficult. You know, and he couldn't help himself. He used to read all my letters. That never helped me. But um, so for me, I started to look for recovery. And there was a guy in the Nick. He'd done 20 years, 22 years. He's a recovering alcoholic. And he said to me one day, there's only one person you've got to get on in this prison. And I went a little bit leery. Well, who's that? And he said, it's yourself. And I knew I didn't get on with Michael. And I, I, I'd been as high as a kite. I did loads of money, pretty, pretty women. That's not disrespect to any girls, because I think a couple of my wives may be watching and, and a few girls, whatever, I don't mean to, whatever. But, and it's not disrespectful to them. They were beautiful, all beautiful ladies. But so I struggled. Uh, and for me, I, I used to look for recovery. But I went into the church and I found... You know, it's not religion for me, but I found some real peace in my mind. I, I, I just, something happened to me. I, I struggled to concentrate. Eddie Richardson's a scholar. Ian Reid, he's a scholar. Bobby McHugh. I struggled. My old man was clever. So I used to go into the church. I used to do a, a lot of gym. You know, I used to do all sorts of things until I found, and then I got clean in the nick from drugs. That helped me as well. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, we all find our different ways forward, but mental health is uh, a thing that I think they look at a lot more today. But there's a number of things that you can do. You're not just left to your own devices in today's environment. I suppose you've got to ask for help. That's yeah. a tough one, pride. In prison, is, there's a lot of class distinction. You're left alone. They know who you are or anything about you. And they know all about you before you even come there. And you mix with the people you know or know a few, or you know somebody that they know. Mm. Don't mix with a whole lot. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks, Bobby. Um, and now another question from the audience, and I think it's a good one actually for Michael, is it's what do you think of gangs today? And I know, Michael, you've talked about the book um, sort of being helping those who are caught up in gangs and showing them there's a new, another way of life. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah. See, from the day of Eddie and Bobby and Brian and all those people, it was a job. Yeah. And today, I just think it's kids who, who know no different. It's got very violent. Um, and and, and so, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry to say this. But these gangs of today, I'm not decrying any of them or anything like that. But to me, that's not crime. So, I mean, I know a young kid, uh, Carl, he's a big, tough, strong kid. He, he, was, he was out of flats in Brixton. You know, he'd been involved with that gang. Uh, and, and something changed his life. You know, he found the faith. He got into recovering. And, and so he goes and does a bit of help. But I feel very sorry for these young kids today. And the reason why I feel sorry for them, because from day dot, they ain't got a chance. I'm from the flat from the council flats, I'm proud of it. But the council flats today are like war zones. Mm -hmm. You know, the killings of, uh, and it, it goes back to 11, 12 year old kids. Not being funny, when they're nicked at 14 for a murder, trust me, they'd wish they'd never done it. I don't care how much they show off in front of their friends. But 
But I think they got their parents are on heavy duty drugs. And, you know, they, they got no chance straight away. And the crimes today, this gang warfare from these young kids killing each other, you know, and I'm not against them. If I could help them, I would. But, and the bird, the, the sentences they give out today, 20 and 30 years, this big bird, you know, and I don't think they realise that. And I think it's a TV thing. Uh, you know, how many people you've done and they, 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 they t and when these big fake, whatever, use them to run drugs, these 10 and 12 year old kids, I think that's a liberty. Young kids being taught something like that. Bobby just told you, he could have been big in the film industry for his father. But their crimes, and I'm not trying to classify or, or make better crimes, but today I think it's such a, it's, it's, it's worse than this coronavirus. It's a pandemic. And I think they should deserve a chance. And I think it's very sad. And once it's in them, from the age of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, once they're 20, 30, they're all in these gangs, they're all killing each other. But let me tell you, there's no free lunches. Very true, very true. And, and Bobby, now over to you. So you've obviously seen Michael go through a sort of transformation from, you know, from when he was a child to now. And what do you think of that transformation? Well, he always was a nice young man and he always had a great personality and charm, which he got from his mother, by the way. She was a charming lady. And he still has it, and he's now got added to it. So it's all for benefit. It's a benefit now to know Michael. Oh, thank you, Bobby. Thank you. It's a benefit lies. to know you, your <laughs> Lord. Tell, I mean, Jenny lies. I'll give you the hundred quid, I promise, afterwards, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Michael, what is the reaction um, from people? Where's Eddie gone? Is he all right? I think he's taking a break. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so what have you found the reaction um, to your transformation from people perhaps in more of your old world? Do, do, do you know what? I mean, that's the obvious mm. question. And I, and I think what it is, you know, I, I haven't done it for an opinion of what other people think. Um, I've done it because I needed to. I've done it because, uh, you know, they say to surrender is, is weak. Mm. Uh, but I surrendered to the insanity that was floating about in me, that I feel it was a hereditary thing. You know, my grandfather committed suicide, Charlie, in a terrible way. He had no chance. And then Brian, my beautiful dad, Brian, he, he suffered. Um, and, and so for me, to change was for the better for my children, for my grandchildren. Listen, if you hit me on the chin and I have a faith today, the Bible says turn the other cheek, I think I'd struggle with that. I think if you smash me, I'd smash your back. But that's not what it's about. What it's about for me today is living a life because I find my peace and I feel I've become a better person and I feel I'm more trustworthy. I'm, I'm, and I've always been a good kid, but when you use them drugs and you get into all this dysfunction, you know, you, you become what you are and I, and I didn't like it no more. It wasn't about not liking the criminal life because I've got to be honest with you, I found it exciting. Didn't want to go back to prison and didn't want to get involved with it no more, out of choice. But I wanted to change so I could get on with Michael, so I could like Michael and be at peace with Michael. And, and when I found that, because I'm at peace with myself or getting there, I, I think it's easier for me to get on with other people. And maybe if they folks say, oh, what's happened? Then, then, I, then I tell them. But I'm not running up and down the road with a big uh, a plaque out going, look at me, I've changed. I want to be it rather than speak it. You know, they say it's attraction rather than promotion. It's what I'm like, whether I'm good looking or ugly or whether I'm fit or fat or whatever. That's fine, all of that. But it's, it's how I feel inside. And, and I tell you what, I haven't been at peace for many, many, many years. Uh, uh, and a lot of people have testified to that. But I always had a good art, I believe. And I'm sort of having a line up now. It, it's, get, it's making life easier for me. I spend a lot of time in the church. I love to pray. I spend a lot of time with, with friends, old friends, new friends, and I just want to be me. You know, I just want to be me. And, and, and if I can do anything to help, and I think the transformation of that for people on drugs, for people for mental health issues, for people who've suffered violence, for people who've been in prisons, if they want a chance to change, then in this book, there's an opportunity to maybe think, well, what did he do to change? Go to the meeting. If you, want to, if you want to go to the church, I think the church is an hospital, to be honest with you, a wonderful hospital and the meetings. And it's all about inner change. You know, I've had all the trappings. 
I've had all the cars and the bet and the, whatever the big gold watches and and the big houses and all things like that. And 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 that never fixed me. Pretty girls and there's been there's a, been some lovely girls in my life. They've been very kind to me, very kind. I've been very fortunate. Wonderful mother Tracy to the children. You know, there's been some one of Daniela. There's so, there's been some wonderful ladies. Uh, and, but if I'm not Michael, what chance they got? You know, I, if I was a very dishonest man when it comes to relationships, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And so for me to be able to say, do you know what? This is what it says on the tin and it works. Then, you know, have a look, have a go. And I pray that everyone finds their peace and they can enjoy their children. I've got mo I've got seven people in my life, besides, I can't want to cry, besides my three girls, my seven grandchildren. I'll tell you what, the gift of them seven grandchildren, God, to have allowed to be their pappy, for me, is worth all the, you know, it's worth all the tea in China. My Paddy, my Gracie Nancy, oh, Teddy Alfie, Nolan, oh, he's a rascal, Nolan. And then I've got this young boy, this young new one called Freddie. It's colossal. And, and, and I, as soon as I see them, my Teddy, my two little girls, my Nancy and Gracie, I would not swap them for nothing. Nothing. And I adore those kids. And I feel emotional because I absolutely adore them children. And I thank my three children for standing by me. Oh, they've been, all of you, they've been colossal. And I've got a blessing. And if I have to do anything in my life, to be their grandfather, then get out of the way. Because no one's taking that away from me, my grandchildren and my girls. No one. No one. They're first class. So if my change has proved that I can be who I need to be in them life, in their lives, them 10 people, then bring it on. Bring it on. Amen. Good for you. Amen. Thank you, Bobby. And um, I think that's an amazing note to end Sorry. on. Sorry. No, it's perfect. So a huge thanks to you all for coming and a massive thanks to Eddie and Bobby as well. Thank um, you. Please do follow us on social media and of course buy the book, Sons of Fathers, on Amazon, Waterstones, etc. And watch the space for future events. And thank, thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, guys. See you. Are we finished? <laughs>